So I know you're all a bit depressed at the moment, so I thought, let's cheer us all up. Let's do an interview with a, a nice cheery optimist. This guy, Rutger Bregman, uh, Utopia for Realists. So it's about how can we build a much better world than the one we currently have. He's got some great ideas. Basic income, that's one. Shorter working week, kitchen. Come on, everyone, this is fantastic stuff. So he's gonna go into detail about these ideas, about how we could build, maybe, just maybe, a utopia. Some people think utopianism is inherently quite a dangerous idea. Mm -hmm. If you have this view of history of natural constant progress where you mm -hmm. create this, you get this perfect society, that's been tried a few times and mm -hmm. it's, it's led to huge amounts of bloodshed, tyranny, totalitarianism, all used to justify mm -hmm. the utopian ideal. That's partly true. I mean, I was born in 1988. It was a year before the fall of the Berlin Wall. You and what, feel really old. What, <laughs> and what, 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 what I was taught at university is that you shouldn't think in utopian terms anymore because it's dangerous. You know, we've all tried that communism, fascism, and we're still counting the corpses, right? But I always had this nagging sense that we had lost something. I mean, democracy was utopian once as well. There are a few ideas which may seem utopian now, but may become reality in the future. The problem nowadays, especially on the left, is that it knows very well what it's against, but it doesn't really have an idea of what it's for. So it's basically against everything, against austerity, against the establishment, against homophobia, against raci racism. And I'm not saying I'm not against all those mm -hmm. things, but you also need to be for something, to the vision of where you want to go. The point I'd often make is the left ended up in a very defensive posture. Why have we ended up so defensive and lacking in imagination of, of, of an alternative? Moments of crisis are really, really important. That, that, those are the moments that you can get new ideas mm -hmm. into the bloodstream of, of thought, you know? The problem was that in 2008, with the financial crash, is that this was another moment of crisis where there should have been new ideas on the, on the shelves, but they weren't there. And my hope is that with 2016, with Brexit and Trump, is that we've done more of our homework. A lot of people watching this video, if I was to sum up their views, I think it's fair to say they would think everything's kind of going to pop. But you kind of challenge that, don't you? Well, the big lesson of history that, is that in the past, everything was worse. Mm -hmm. We're still living in a period in history where we are incredibly wealthy, healthy, very safe, and we should be grateful for that. The second thing is that there are really exciting ideas out there right now that are gaining in popularity. I think the best example is the idea of a universal basic income to just completely eradicate poverty, and it's taking off. Just talk about the history of kind of basic income, mm -hmm. because as you point out, it was that well-known lefty, Richard Nixon, who uh, <laughs> experimented with the idea, didn't yeah. implement it, rather than actually necessarily being something which just comes to the left of politics, mm -hmm. it was Milton Friedman. Yeah. He framed it more, maybe more as a negative mm -hmm. income tax, but mm -hmm. de facto very, very similar. It's basically the same. People from the left to the right, all the great economists, they all thought that this was going to happen. So not only Milton Friedman believed that, but also, also Martin Luther King. Nixon didn't think of it himself. Mm -hmm. He just wanted to make history. He thought, oh, this is, this is an idea that everyone's buying into right now, let's do it. So his proposal for a modest basic income got through Congress twice, and it was only uh, shot down in the Senate because Democrats thought that his proposal wasn't high enough. A lot of critics of, of basic income, being devil's advocate here, but they'll go, just make everyone lazy. Well, what I found is that when you ask people, what would you do with a basic income? About 90% of people say, you know, I've got dreams. I'm going to do something useful with it. Don't worry, I'm going to quit my bullshit job and <laughs> uh, it's going to be great. But if you then ask them, what would other people do with a basic income? About 90% of all people say, I oh, know, other people, they'll probably waste it on drugs and alcohol, etc. And that's why I think you need to look at the evidence. There's one famous experiment that was done in Canada in the 1970s. It went on for four years. They didn't have money left to analyze the results because a new conservative government had come into power and they said, what kind of crazy experiment is this? Stop it. And then 25 years later, a Canadian professor found the records, did the analysis and discovered that it had been hugely successful. People didn't massively quit their jobs, that the hospitalization rate decreased by 8.5%, crime went down, kids performed better at school. That's the thing we keep forgetting all the time. Poverty is hugely expensive in terms of higher healthcare, uh, more crime, um, you name it. Is one of the main justifications for basic income, income technological change. One study suggests in Britain 11 million jobs could go, not just low-skill, semi-skilled jobs like before, but middle-class professional jobs. So is it now the case, do you think, that work is going to become more and more precarious mm -hmm. and that a basic income gives more stability mm -hmm. and security to a more 
insecure workforce. Is that one of the justifications? Well, yes, definitely. But I think that we underestimate capitalism's extraordinary ability to come up with new bullshit jobs. There's one poll that was done in 2014 by YouGov that found that 37% of all British workers think they have a job that doesn't even need to exist. Uh, <laughs> Now I'm not Hi, talking about the, no, 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 I'm not talking <laughs> about you. I'm not, I'm not talking about the care workers or the garbage men or uh, the teachers here. Which bullshit jobs do you want to get rid of? It's really interesting that it's especially the people who have brilliant resumes, mm. earn very decent salaries, have great jobs. The only problem is that at the end of the day, you give them one beer or maybe two, and they'll start confessing, my job is completely useless. I think that is one of the biggest taboos of our time. There's, there's one thing though that you can always use to see if, if, if a job is useless or actually quite useful. You can just go on strike and see what happens. So in the book I've got one example of a strike that happened in 1968 with garbage men. A big city like New York can survive a strike of garbage men for about a week and then you know the emergency state has to be declared and it's, it's a complete disaster. So those are very useful jobs. And then I just wondered has it ever happened at one point in history that the bankers went on strike? And actually I found only one example in all of world history. Uh, so for the past thousands of years there was only one time it actually happened and that was Ireland 1970. All the experts predicted disaster, economists were saying this is, this is a heart attack for the economy and then nothing happened. You propose a 15 hour week. In 1930, I think it was, yeah. John Maynard Keynes predicted that by now, I think, he, was it a 14-hour week? Uh, anyway, we'd 15, be, yeah. it was 15, yeah. is that what he did predict, 15. How did he get it so wrong? Well, here again, he wasn't the only one. So Keynes' prediction may seem completely crazy or ludicrous, but it was just mainstream back then. But it didn't quite happen. In the 60s and in the 70s, the work we kept shrinking and shrinking. But then around 1980, especially in the US, but also in the UK and other European countries, people started working more and more. So the first explanation is consumerism. We keep buying stuff we don't need to impress people we don't like. Uh, <laughs> that's that's the, 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 the most common explanation. I'm personally more in favor of the, of the other explanation by David Graeber. Since the, the 1980s, we've seen a huge amount of new jobs that don't really need to exist. And as long as you stick to the ideology that you have to work for your money, if we keep using that 19th century mm. mindset, mm -hmm. then, you know, at some point, all jobs will be useless, but we still, we'll still have jobs. We need to rethink what work actually is, because mm. there's so much work that's unpaid, but incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. Volunteers work, caring for our kids, caring for our elderly. It doesn't add to GDP. Uh, but go on strike and it's if all the Fails. yeah why is it bad for people why is it good to spend more time mm -hmm. on, on leisure everyone in the 1930s and 40s believed that the big challenge of the future was going to be boredom yeah. nowadays it's stress just think about the waste and the costs we know for example is that people who work longer work weeks they're not m more productive henry ford already discovered that in the 1920s but you should also think about not only the cost of stress but also uh, the cost of poverty we often frame our argument in terms of fairness or caring for, for other people. And I think that's, I mean, that's entirely right. But you could also use right-wing rhetoric to defend leftist ideals. Mm -hmm. For example, poverty is hugely expensive. The costs of child poverty are, in the US are estimated $500 billion each year in terms of higher healthcare spending, higher dropout rates, more crime, incredible waste of human potential. Mm -hmm. It would cost just $175 billion, a quarter of the country's military budget, to eradicate poverty, to get all the poor above the poverty line. If you really go directly at the root of the problem, try to eradicate it, that's an investment. We need to talk much more about these issues in terms of investments with really good returns. The so-called mm -hmm. Centre of Social Justice, which is mm -hmm. um, should be ironically named, but it was set up by Ian Duncan Smith. And they argue that child poverty is often not about money, mm -hmm. it's about parents and their bad choices, mm -hmm cigarettes, alcohol, mm -hmm. family breakdowns. And he's right. Is he? Yeah, he's actually right. Well, well, there's a lot of data that shows that the poor people make many poor decisions. It's just that the reason is completely different than what politicians like him think. It starts off with an experiment that was done in India. They went to India and did an experiment with sugarcane farmers. And you should know that these farmers collect about 60% of their annual income all at once, right after the harvest. And they did an IQ test before and after the harvest. The farmers scored much worse on the IQ test before the harvest. The effects of living in poverty 
correspond to losing about 14 points of IQ. So yeah, it's true. The poor make many poor decisions because not, not because they're dumb or something, because, but because anyone would make dumb decisions in the same situation. Poverty actually impinges on your mind. It's like a tunnel vision. You only can think about the next day or, or maybe the day after that, but you don't have a long-term vision. So what you need to do is just get people above the poverty line and you will not only get an explosion of ambition and energy, but people will also be a lot smarter. One of the arguments you make in the, in the book is certainly bold, mm -hmm. uh, which is open borders. I would say that's probably, in the current climate, one of the most unsellable ideas I can think of. How on earth are you going to sell such an idea and what's the basis for it? We know from so many studies that global inequality is huge, much bigger than national inequality. And the most powerful instrument we have in the fight against global poverty is immigration. And there's so much nonsense going around about it. The migrants will take our jobs, that they'll uh, be lazy at the same time. <laughs> I mean, I agree with you that this is, this is a very difficult subject, especially for the near future. But that doesn't mean I think we should completely surrender it. But isn't the problem there, I mean, the scientific research you offer is very, very compelling. Now, the right often speak in terms of stories, the left often resort to facts and statistics, mm -hmm. but they have an emotional case, they go for here, Okay, here's not a story for, here. for you. It should be about nationalism, actually. Nowadays, we, we associate nationalism with inward lookingness and protecting what you've already got. In the 19s, in the Netherlands, there was this ideology of the Netherlands being a guide country, being like the most tolerant country on earth. You can be, I think, feel patriotic about quite progressive ideas. We're going to be the first economy that's entirely sustainable. We're going to be the first, uh, or like, think of Merkel, reshuffen us. We're a strong country. The Germans can do this. That's framing <coughs> tolerance and being welcome to migrants in terms of patriotism. But wouldn't every country on earth have to basically abolish borders at the same time? If just one country abolished their borders, which is... Well, again, a very I mean, this is... Step, say the least, I must say this is a utopian idea, but... Let's say we're in the year 2300, and let's look ba back upon our time. What is the biggest injustice of our time? It's, it's, it's borders. I mean, it's the biggest source of discrimination we have right now. As you say, I mean, so the average American earns nearly three times as much for the same work as a Bolivian, yeah. even when they have the same skill level aid and sex, with a comparable Nigerian, the difference is a factor of eight and a half. That's adjusted yeah, for purchase. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, we're talking about discrimination between black and white or men and women all the time, and it, I mean, that's, that's hugely important, but it pills just in comparison with the differences between, between borders and people living in other countries. Why do you think it's become so prevalent in both our countries to mm -hmm. scapegoat migrants, refugees, people from other countries mm -hmm. for all the problems that exist in our societies? The right, and especially the populist right, understands much better the way politics work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that it's all about developing a con consistent narrative, repeating it all the time, pushing at the, at the boundaries of what's politically acceptable and then just shifting it. Geert Wilders is the uh, Dutch Donald Trump, if you like. We've seen this tidal wave of right-wing populism, uh, xenophobic populism mm -hmm. sweeping over the Western world. Is the Netherlands the next domino to fall? Well, it was the first, actually. When Donald Trump started shocking everyone, we in, we in the Netherlands were like, mm, we've all seen this before. So years ago, he was already saying crazy things. He was referring to mosques as hate palaces. Yeah, this is he's, yes, now he's saying that we need to close down all mosques, ban the Quran, etc. In the, in the 90s, the Netherlands had arrived at the end of history. Politics was just all a matter of te technocracy, all management. Then came the, fall of the, the, the Twin Towers, then came Pim Fortuyn, then came Geert Wilders, and now everything is open again when it's about culture. That's the big dividing line right now. But the interesting thing is that, economically speaking, we're still living in a technocracy. We still have the same policies, still the same ideas, still the same people saying the same things based on the same outdated ideas. So, Geert Wilders, he's the most successful utopian thinker in our country. He's saying completely outrageous things all the time, that, for example, Muslim women should pay to wear a head tax with a head rack tax, he calls it. Uh, it's the most awful things, but people get adjusted to it. So that, I think that's how it works. Can you see the echoes of the 1930s in terms of what we're going through at the moment? And does, Definitely. Does that not disturb you for yeah. the future of this? Well, it does actually, yeah. So there are a few differences. The first one is that we're not as used to violence as we were in the 1930s. Also, the global institutions are much stronger than they were in the, in the 1930s. But there are other 
like very scary similarities. Trump is a huge narcissist. If you if you read biographies of Mussolini or Hitler, you just be, be struck how 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 good the they they compare. I think we should all really be afraid when when violence starts when we start get to get used to that. And we haven't seen that yet in the in the US. And finally, in a way, isn't this kind of the wrong the wrong way around in terms of what our approach should be? It should be realism for utopians, in the sense that <laughs> I think of myself as a pragmatist. Yeah. You know, I don't think it makes sense for utilities and services like the railways to be run by private profiteers. It's a natural yeah. monopoly. I think mm -hmm. it's utopian to have a society which is not based on people's needs, but mm -hmm. is instead based on profit. It's a very ideological model to have, mm -hmm. a very utopian model. You know, we're the pragmatists. Yeah, They're I the agree. extremists, yeah. Yeah. all the utopians. That's what I try all the time, is just to show that universal basic income, for example, it's not a crazy idea. There's yeah. a lot of scientific evidence that shows that it works. We can afford it, we've got the research, we've got the evidence, we can do it tomorrow. Politically, it might not be feasible to do, do it tomorrow, but technically, we can. Do you think it will happen in our lifetime, UBI? We've got no idea. I'm not, I'm not an optimist, I'm not a pessimist, I'm a possibilist. I think that things can be different. There's nothing natural about the way we've structured our society, about the way we've structured our economy can all be different. Well, I thought that was fascinating stuff. I'm sure there are bits people disagree with, uh, but I want to get a debate going about this. Leave some comments. What do you think about his proposals? Uh, do you have your own proposals? What sort of world would you like to build? What sort of policies would you like to pursue? Bring it on. Let's build this world below the comments and YouTube. Easily done. We've got loads of other interviews to come. Loads of interviews probably up here, if Adam's put them there, otherwise I'm just waving in the air. As ever, uh, leave your comments, subscribe. I'll see you next time.